I just got to say, this is a beautiful group of people. I'm talking about you, absolutely. Am I on your good side yet? All right, sounds good. Just want to introduce myself. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. If this is one of your first times here, I just know, I know this to be true, that God has you here for a reason. You are not here by accident. You are not here by chance. But God has a message of hope, encouragement, and love that he wants to speak into your life today. If you believe that, say amen with me. He does. He really does. He wants to share something deep with you today, and it's so great. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to share this with you, but before I do, um, this is part four of a message series that we're in called A Little Bit of Wisdom, A Little Bit of Wisdom, a, a series about uh, that's on the book of Proverbs, which is known as the book of wisdom from our Bibles, but before I dive into that today, I just want to um, talk about how today is the last day of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. <laughs> Woo! Someone say breakfast time. Break the fast time, that's what they say, and I, I don't know about y'all, but um, it's all about a round table buffet right after church today. That's what I'm talking about. I've been fasting for 21 days, and I'm ready to, um, you know, get it all back. You know what I'm talking about? So I just want to also say one more thing. If, if some of you have engaged with this with us, you know, you, you gave up something in your life. We talked about it at the beginning of the first 21 days. Maybe you gave up social media. Maybe you gave up one meal of your day. Maybe you gave up, you know, something else. Um, and I just want to encourage you that, um, you know, if, if you struggled with that, just know that we all struggle with that. I was struggling myself. I went the first 14 days, and I, and I gave up some eating stuff, and I was, I was feeling it, man. I'm just telling you. And if you felt like it was a, a struggle for you, just know it, it's a struggle for all of us. But no matter how far you were able to make it in the fast, no matter how well you heard God, let me just tell you that we're all in a, in a growth season, every single one of us, myself included, we're all just taking steps towards Jesus. We're all, we're all on a growth progression. And no matter if you were able to fast for one day, two day, uh, 14 days, or you made it till yesterday, you just broke. I just want to tell you I'm proud of you for doing that. And I pray that the next time, because we're going to keep on doing this. So when you do it with us the next time, you're going to get a little bit better. You're going to be able to silence the voice of the world, trying to chime in all the time. And, and you'll be able to hear the voice of God even better. Amen. So maybe the, the fast is going to come to an end today, but our prayer life never ends, right? So let's just keep on path with that. And I just want to tell you as a church, I'm so proud of you uh, for engaging with us with the 21 days of prayer and fasting. I, I don't know about y'all, but, you know, I just, I got so much out of it. This is actually one of the most powerful fasting seasons I've ever had in my life. This is the last week. And it all happened in the last week. The first 14 days were like, all I could think about is how hungry I am. I can't hear Jesus because all I can hear is my stomach going, I'm hungry, all right? But this last seven days, I was reading my Bible in the morning, and it seemed like every single time I opened my Bible, there was a sermon in there. I'm like, man, God's voice got so loud, especially towards the end of that. And, and I just hope that as you continue to grow in this, in this discipline, that um, it'll do, be the same for you. It'll be the same for you. So let's, let's jump in. Let's get stuck in here. Father, bless your word today, and I pray that our hearts and minds will be open to receive from you today. Our, our whole series is from Proverbs, and Proverbs 4, 7 says it the best. Wisdom is, say it with me, supreme. Wisdom is supreme. It's at the very top of God's list. Like, therefore, get it. Go after it. Get wisdom, though it costs you all you have. Write that check, because wisdom is worth having. It's worth more than the money in your bank account. It's worth more than the time you get to decompress or whatever. The Bible is trying to tell us that wisdom is supreme. It is supreme. Today's message is for everybody. I'll tell you why. Because if you want to be a better mom, this message is for you. If you want to be a better dad, this message is for you. If you want to be a better spouse, can I hear an amen from the person next to you? Better spouse, um, this message is for you. If you want to be better with money, this message is for you. We all want to get better. Can I, can I hear someone say amen to that? You know, we all want to get better. Every, that's why you, you came today. You're, you wouldn't be here if you didn't want something in your life, either spiritually or practically, to at least improve. That's why you got out of bed, got all dressed up, looked so good the way you do. That's why you're tuning in online, Facebook. And I hope, actually, Bunny Trail, anybody listening online right now, God bless you. I'm so glad you were able to, to join us for this. And I hope one day we get to meet you face to face. I know we have so many people that are able to join us online. Come on in. We'd love to meet you. There's nothing like meeting someone face to face and shaking that hand. But, you know, this message is for everybody. It's for all of us because every single one of us, we all want to get better. So this book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs that we're in, um, is about 
us improving and about us growing in wisdom. But let me tell you something. Goals don't equal results. Man, can I hear some Raider fans in the place? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I hear some 49er fans in the place? I'm just saying, every team starts out the season in the locker room saying, this is our year, gentlemen. We're going to get in the Super Bowl. But there are only two teams that made it. You know, you know what I'm saying? Goals don't automatically equal results. And that's why 92% of your New Year's resolutions are dead by now. Because this culture teaches us to make New Year's resolutions, but that doesn't, just because we have a goal, doesn't mean we automatically stick with it. That's what today's message is all about. Is, so that's a problem, right? What's the solution then? What's the solution to that? The Bible seems to think that the answer is teachability. Teachability. Those teams that have a terrible last season, and they, have, and they reevaluate everything. We're going to do our practices different. We're going to do our, our, our formations different. We're going to do our huddles different. We're going to do everything. The ones that are teachable, those are the ones that grow into the champions. And the Bible is saying that is exactly what your life is like, when my life is like. Let me point the finger back here. When, when I learn to be teachable, that's when I really grow in wisdom. That's why I called the, the, this message the life of a learner. The li- I want you to have a life that is a learner. I want you to be a learner in your life, the life of a learner, because 26 out of 31 chapters in Proverbs is about this, top, is about this topic, teachability, and 10 of those chapters start with it. Those who are, those who are wise listen and, and will receive understanding. Most of the chapters in Proverbs, the wisest book in your whole Bible, starts with teachability, teachability. It seems to think that there's a, there's a focus here, so let's, let's talk about um, Let's talk about something that's, that's kind of interesting, kind of funny a little bit. You know, let's talk about talking because talking is, uh, how do they say it, the opposite of listening. So let's talk about talking for a second. The proverb says it like this out of chapter 10. The wise are glad to be instructed, but babbling fools fall flat on their face. Who wants to be known as a babbling fool today? Show of hands, who wants to be known as a babbling fool? Not me. Neither do you. We don't want to be known as a babbling fool. But let me just explain to you what what a babbling fool could also be called. Maybe you've never been called a babbling fool. But let me talk about some some talkers that the Bible talks about. Number one, this is in your notes. You can actually take out your bulletin. There's actually a page in there with some blanks on there that you can fill in as we're going. I'll let you know when they come so you can keep up. The first blank is this. It's uh, the foolish talker, the babbling fool, the know-it-all. The know-it-all. This person... You ever met, this is none of you. This is, these next three people, I'm going to tell, none of you deal, this is probably, you know, your coworker. You know, this is probably, you know, a distant relative. None of you would struggle with any of this. So let's talk about some people who aren't here today, the know-it-all. The one that says, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I knew that. I knew that. You can't tell me anything. Why? Because I know everything. The know-it-all. Listen to what Proverbs 28 says about this. This is hilarious to me. Those who trust in their own insight are foolish, but anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. Man, Proverbs says you're a fool for doing that. The know-it-all cares about one person's opinion, and whose is that? Their own. That's right, because they love what they have to say about the matter. They ain't listening to you. They don't care what you have to say about the matter. Let me tell you what, oh yeah, oh yeah. It sounds like this. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know anybody like that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They roll their head back. Their head's about to fall off. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The know it all. The know it all. They only care about their own opinion, and, and the Bible says you're a fool for doing that. You're a fool. None of you, though. None of you are fool. None of you. Let's talk about this next person, though. Uh, the been there, done that guy. Been there, done that. Um, you know, actually, I, I had an illustration last service, but I, I needed to change it because it was like, it was too real. It was too real, y'all. And so it's the person that no matter what you've done, no matter what you've done, they did that. And you know what they like to do? They like to downplay it a little bit. It's like, let's say you just went skiing for the first time. Skiing for the first And you're excited about it. It's like, man, I like skiing. Or snowboarding. Man, y'all look at me like, skiing is dumb. Well, fine. Snowboarding. Cool. Whatever you like. You just went, and you're trying to tell, you're trying to tell somebody about it. And you're like, man, it was so exciting. I'm pumped up. I'm so cool, man. Lo- and they just look at you and go, oh, yeah, I did that like five times. Yeah. And they like to play it down. Oh, yeah, it's no big deal. It's like, pff, yeah, everybody goes snowboarding. Been there, done that. They don't care about what you're going. They don't care that you're excited about it. They don't care that that was your first time. They're not even listening to you. 
They just can't wait to tell you what they did and what they like to do. Listen to what the Bible says. Proverbs 18, 2. Fools have no interest in what you have to say. They just don't care. They don't care. They have no interest in understanding. They only want to err their own opinion. They're like, oh, you went skiing? You went snowboarding? Oh, that's, that's nice. I've done that. Let me tell you about when I do it. None of you have ever done that, right? Right. None of you have ever done any of these things. You just can't wait to, you know, for them to finish their story so you can, you know, tell them about your own story. None of you have ever done that. That's fine. They don't care what you went through. They're just waiting for you to shut up long enough. Right? None of you. But have you ever noticed some people, not you, some people, they're, they're looking at you. They're listening to you. They're nodding. But you can just tell. They're just waiting for me to shut up, aren't they? Because they're just going to fire something. All they're, they're not listening to me. They're just thinking about what they're going to say when I finally shut up, aren't they? Don't you love people like that? Don't you love people who, like, you're, like, pouring your heart out to them, and they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you can see the gears turning. They just can't wait to tell you their story. Proverbs says you're a fool. You're a fool if you do that. Let's talk about this one last person, uh, the one-upper. Okay, the one-upper. All right, if you climbed Mount Everest, they did it in their flip-flops. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, they got another level for you. They got, you don't know anybody like this, right? Men, none of you have ever done this. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I did that, but I did it. You could just fill in the blank, man. We, we love to do this, us guys, you know. None of you ladies, man, you, you're, none of you are fools. Us men, though, we got to really work on this one. Um, there is nothing you have done that outdoes them in any topic, in any topic. And check this out. Listen, tell me if I'm lying. If they don't have a story to top your story, they'll just change the subject. They'll just change it. Let's say, for example, you got an A, and let's say you're in high school, you know, you went, maybe you're in college going through algebra, man. If you're in college going through algebra, I'm just saying, man, it's all good. But you're excited. Math is my weak suit. I got an A in algebra, and you're trying to tell somebody at work about it, and you're like, yeah, man, I got this A. Man, I worked really hard. I got a tutor. Like, you're, like, telling them your experience, Right? And they're like, listen, uh-huh, uh-huh, that's nice. I just got a new car. What? Man, I'm not even talking about cars. I'm talking about math. I'm talking about what I went through. They just change the subject to something that's better. Oh, I guess we're talking about your car now. They just don't care. They don't care what you're talking about. They don't care what you're going through. And that seems to be kind of what it boils down to in, uh, in, in general here. Proverbs 12 says it like this. Fools think their own way is right. But the wise Listen to others. And that's what it all comes down to is, is fools just don't like to listen to people. They like to listen to respond. Anybody? <laughs> I'm guilty of that a lot of the times. None of you. I'll be honest. You just sit there real quiet and like, it's good. I know I got you. It's all good. It's okay. Or maybe it's, a, maybe it's you know, your friend. Your friend does this. Fine, whatever. But that's what the struggle really is, listening. They, they know it all. They've been there, done that. They did better than you. But it all boils down to this. They just don't care about listening to you or anybody for that matter. They listen only long enough to fire back what they think. And Proverbs says you're a fool if you do those things. All jokes aside, we, we've all done it. We, we've all done this, and that's the problem. But here's a little key to wisdom I want to share with you. Uh, this might be in your notes. I'm not even sure if it is. I know it's on the screen. But listen to this statement. And, and let me explain it. Listening lifts the lid to wisdom. Let me explain it. Uh, a lid can be referred to as a limit. Like we all have lids in our lives. And I'm telling you that in wisdom, your, your wisdom can only go as high as your ability to listen well to others. So if you learn to listen, it lifts the lid to the amount of wisdom you're going to have in your life. Wise people love wisdom listening. So that's why I say it that way. Listening lifts the lid to wisdom. So let's talk about the answer. Those are all problems that we have, you know, as Americans especially. I just got to say it. My wife is actually, um, she's been through a lot of classes on linguistics, so she knows about language and different cultures and whatnot. And one of her teachers explained it where all these different cultures, all the different countries, you can relate their way of conversating with one another um, with sports. And so I think it was German. German is like rugby, they will just, in conversation, the natural way is to, like, tackle each other and yell. So it's natural for them around the dinner table to just be rah, 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 yelling at each other. That's normal and natural. In Japan, the Japanese culture is like, they, it's like 
they got these big old gaps in their conversation. It's like, I'm trying to talk to you. And then I'm like, so how's your day? And they sit there. They're thinking about it. It's like, because they're going to tell me the truth. <laughs> they're going to, just like golf. They, they walk up to what they're going to say. They look at it. They get their footing. And then they back off again and look at it again. You ever golf with someone like this? And it's like, man, just hurry up. And you stand over it. And then they finally say, my day was good. It's like, man, you could have said that like 10 minutes ago. But Americans, it's like tennis. How was your day? It was good. How about yours? No, I ate some. I ate, had good breakfast. No, how was your lunch? Oh, it was good. It's just like bong, bong. It's like ping pong going back and forth. It's like all we're doing is responding. All it is is this string of responses. We never really, it's in our culture to not listen, to not wait and actually say, when we say, how, how was your day? And then somebody wants to tell us <laughs> how their day really is going. And we're like, oh, snap. That's when we realize we really, you know, we were just, it was just like pleasantries, right? But it's in our culture to be that way. Um, and Proverbs says, uh, we're fools. <laughs> we're fools for doing that. So let's talk about the answer. Let's talk about listening. What is a listening heart? Like, because listening, you have to care to listen. Honestly, if you don't care, you can only fake it. If you don't really care, then you really shouldn't even ask, you know, because we, it takes a heart. So that's why I, that's why I said the listening heart. We, we, need, we want to have a heart to actually care what someone's saying. The listening heart goes like this in Proverbs 1, 5. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. Now, you would think that wise people don't need to listen because they're wise. But your Bible says that's exactly what makes them wise, their ability to listen. And that, like, I don't know about you, but it confuses me. I, I always want to think, like, if someone's wise, they don't need to receive instruction and correction. But the Bible says, no, that's exactly what makes them wise. It's because they, they receive, they listen. That's what makes them wise. It's not that they're wise they don't have to listen anymore. No, that's what makes it. They continually listen, even after wisdom has come into their life. I got a story about this. I, I mean, we've all struggled with this, but me personally, I definitely have. Um, when I first came to church here, it was about 10 years ago. I, I started coming to church here about 10 years ago. So I was saved for two years. I didn't go to church anywhere for about two years after I got saved. I just got saved. It was a miracle, you know, clean and sober and saved and everything. And I just was doing my own thing. But then I landed here, and my pastor here was a huge blessing and was just one of those guys that was like, come on, come on, get busy. Here, you play guitar? No, not yet? Learn. Get up there. And he was just like that. He was really good at releasing people. So I ended up on the youth group leadership team as a musician there. I've been playing drums my whole life. I'm a rock and roll drummer, metal drummer. Been that way my whole life, and I still like it. I, that's actually my drum kit right there. I got a double kick on it and everything. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But uh, I was on the youth team, and in passing with one of the other leaders, like the main leader who did, did most of the speaking, I had said something that rubbed them the wrong way. Now, with all integrity, I did not mean that. You know, with all honesty, in my, I didn't mean to say anything. But, and I didn't know when I said it that that was a hot button issue for that person. Nonetheless, I said it. And then I was like, doo doo doo. I had no idea what I had done. Is, has anyone ever done anything like that? And then you find out the next day how much trouble you're in. So I got a phone call the next morning. And it's Pastor Tiffany, who we were only dating at the time. But she calls me and says, you need to call PK. I'm like, I need to call him? Yeah, you need to call him. I knew right then I was sunk, man. I was sunk. I was in trouble. I knew something was wrong. And he begins, I call him, he begins to lay into me. And with all integrity, my, I, I, I was above reproach. I didn't mean anything by it. I wasn't, in my own eyes, I was right. But what he was doing, looking back, you know, hindsight is so valuable. Looking back, I can see what he was doing. He was giving me an opportunity and he wanted to find out for himself, is this a guy who can receive correction? Is this a guy that when I come at is he going to listen to me? Or is he going to be like everybody else and just be like, I don't need this. Don't we do that? Someone wants to try and correct us, bring correction to him. We're like, man, get out of here. It's almost natural to do that. But I was in that conversation, and you can call it the Holy Spirit. You can call it God. You can call it whatever you I knew. I knew I needed to just submit. I needed to just be humble. And in that moment, 
I, I, don't, I didn't know it then, but that was, a, that was a why in my road. I was just, you know, that was like the turning point where my ministry career and my spiritual life began to skyrocket at that moment where I said, you know what, PK, I, I didn't mean that, but you know, would you please let me make it right. I'll make it right with them. I'll make it right with you. Even though in my heart, I knew, I was like, I didn't even say anything that bad, you know. But that was just my own opinion. I knew that even if somebody else heard it wrong, for me, that's enough. I can go and apologize. I can go and make this right. And I, I was actually physically hurt, like inside of me. I, was, I went through a, a season of mourning and, and loss. But I, looking back, I know I began to skyrocket in that moment. Now, I, don't, I haven't always done really well at this, but this was one time, and it was a very significant moment in my life. But the listening heart is humble, and that's in your notes. The listening heart is humble. Now, there's, there's a difference between being humiliated and being humble, but it's not as big a difference as you think. Being humiliated is an event that happens to you. Being humble is what you decide to do in that moment. Being humble is a choice. Being humiliated is an action. I was humiliated when that happened. I'm like, here's my pastor on the phone with me telling me, you know, that I did something wrong. It's humiliating. I had to go back to my team. It was humiliating. It was humiliating. But that's just, being humiliated is an event. You know, can you hear the similarities in the word of humiliation and being humble? There's a similarity there, and they are very similar. But being humble is a choice I decide to make. In that moment, even though I'm humiliated, I'm choosing to take the high road of taking the low road of being humble. It's it's crazy to think about it, but Proverbs 11, I mean, it's so counterintuitive, isn't it? It's so counterintuitive. A lot of people would do this too. Man, I didn't mean that. She she shouldn't have said that. That person shouldn't have said that. Yeah, I don't deserve this. I know that I'm right. You don't, you don't. But pride, Proverbs 11 says, pride leads to disgrace. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Now, this is a big, this is a big thing. This is a big topic, bigger than just one Sunday. I could talk about humility for many weeks in a row, but it's so important. When you choose the path of the humble, you are choosing the path of wisdom. Number two, the listening heart has a desire to grow. The listening heart has a desire to grow. We, we need to know that when these... Uh, opportunities, I'm using air quotes, the opportunities to be humble, these opportunities to grow, because they don't feel like opportunities when you're in them. No, no, they don't. But these opportunities to be humble come, they are actually our opportunities to grow. But only wise people see it that way. Like in that moment, I felt like this was an opportunity for me to feel terrible about myself. Looking back, I know that was my opportunity to grow into a next level that I never would have seen if I never would have learned humility. Okay, and, and if we want to grow, we need to know that growth hurts. Has anyone ever been to the gym and did a leg day? Come on, somebody show me you've done leg day. What happens the next day? It hurts, baby. Come on, it hurts. Growth hurts. What's happening in there? Your muscles are growing. What about when your um, adolescent child is like, Mommy, Daddy, my legs hurt. It's all right, honey. Those are just growing pains, right? It's, it's built into our physiology. God made it that way, and the spiritual is true as well. When we're hurting, we need to know that we're growing. We need to know that we're growing. I actually had a conversation with a pastor friend of mine recently because I had an issue in my life. I had an issue in ministry where I was like, man, it was like we, I wasn't connecting with somebody. It was a really tense situation I was in, and I called my pastor friend on the phone he pastor of a big church over there, down the road over there, and he's really great to me and really helps me in a lot of areas. And, and I explained the situation to him, and I'm like, man, I'm really hurt about this. And he's like, that's all right. Your church, it's just because your church is growing. I'm like, what? He's like, only growing churches, you, you only experience that when your church is growing. I'm like, what? I, I, I like, took me a while, you know? I'm not the brightest bulb in the box. I'm just like, what, what? He's like, if your church wasn't doing anything or going anywhere, you wouldn't ever hurt. You would never be going any, through anything awkward and new because you'd just do the same thing and be the same people. And I'm, I got news for you. When you put new people in your life, it's, sometimes it's kind of weird. And when I, looked, when I learned to look at it that way, oh, man, it's all right. I'm hurting, but I know I'm growing. Oh, that's what I want for every single one of you. When you're hurting, you, you can be growing too. You could be growing too. That's actually growth. I want you to embrace the pain of growth so you can see the fruit that comes with growth. That's what I want in your life. 
you have a desire to grow. And we actually need to see those people that bring those opportunities to us as friends. Listen, because some of you maybe have heard this before in Proverbs 27. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Have you ever seen iron sharpening iron? There's grinding, there's heat, there's friction. What about that sounds comfortable to you? Nothing. It's not co- growth and sharpening and wisdom. It's not comfortable. It's not pleasant. But if you want to be sharp, man, if you want to be sharp, that's what it takes. You got to get ground down a little bit. And you got to get those nicks out. And that comes from that scraping that happens. And we need to learn to look at those people in our lives that bring correction to us, that bring those opportunities to be humble, man, that's my best friend right there because that's how I'm staying sharp. That's how I'm staying wise. Only if you're listening, though. Only if you're listening to them. Only if you're receiving that, which leads me to my next point, which is uh, the listening heart will embrace correction. The listening heart embraces it and goes, yeah, all right, I'm going to receive that. I want to receive that listening heart. But let me tell you, just be honest, nobody likes correction. I know that. Nobody likes correction. I don't like correction any more than you do. Nobody likes it. But the wise choose to embrace it. And here's something that makes it harder. A lot of us perceive correction as rejection. We perceive correction as rejection. See, I could have looked at my pastor in that moment and been like, he's rejecting me. He doesn't like me. He's rejecting me. But no, we need to learn to look at those opportunities like this, uh, this is not me being rejected. I'm being corrected, and that's all right. Um, and the enemy of your soul, the devil, he'll help you interpret it as rejection. He really will. He makes it easy for you to feel like, oh, I'm just being rejected. And that makes people respond in two different ways. Number one, they can get depressed. You know, Eeyore. Uh, doesn't like me. Uh, it's no good. I'm no good. I suck at everything. Uh, I'm terrible. And you know what that really is? That's shining the light in a different way. So it's not at the. It's not on the issue at hand. That's that's like. So someone's trying to bring correction to you, and so you, ah, you pivot out of the way so it's not on the issue, and being depressed about it is easier than actually facing the issue. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, a, it's a type of deflection, and it makes other people respond a different way. Angry. Who do you think you are telling me? I know what I'm doing. What, well, what about you? You don't have your act together either. What about it makes some people depressed, and it makes some people angry, and they'll fire back at you. And you know what that is? That's, again, boop, there, because it hurts. Correction hurts. It's shining the light, and what they do is they get a mirror out. And they want to shine it back on you because they can't, because it hurts. And I don't want to handle it being on the issue. So I'm going to deflect it either onto my depression or onto the anger. So the Bible says this about it. Proverbs 12 says this, to learn, you must love discipline. What a, hold up, Bible. Hold up, Solomon. Love, who loves discipline? To learn, you must love discipline. It goes on to say, it is stupid to hate correction. Most Bibles translate it, if you hate correction, those who hate correction are stupid. Now, the Bible wasn't written that way. It was written in Greek. But apparently, (laughs) the translators thought that was the best way to translate what was written down. Those who hate correction are are stupid. Man, oh, sorry. I mean, because that hurts me too. Because I don't always do this. But sometimes when someone tells me something that ain't right about me, I'm like, man, who do you think you are? And uh, the Bible says I'm stupid for doing that. Not just foolish, but stupid. But there's a third way, and I need to tell you about this third way. The third way is to just receive it. What if we decided ahead of time as a group of people right now? Look, look at this. Look, look, look at me in the eyes right now. What if we decided ahead of time? That when correction came our way, that we would have a script ready. You know what? I didn't see it that way. Thank you for sharing that with me. How hard is that, really? How hard is that, really? Thank you. 
I'm so glad you shared that with me. I didn't see it that way. Because every single one of us have blind spots. It goes from about here all the way over here. It's a big area. We, there are things about our lives that we just can't see that other people can see very easily. And this is the benefit of being married. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I got you there, huh? <laughs> but but what, a, what a benefit married people have. You have someone in your life who loves you, but we don't interpret it that way, but they want to bring correction, and, and we can do something really dangerous too. We can teach our spouse or we can teach people in our lives, just don't go there by not receiving it and by consistently saying, get out of here, don't tell me about that. And we're teaching people in our lives, this is married or not, coworkers, friends, family, we can inadvertently keep correction out of our life because it hurts so much, and correction will stop coming. And that's not a place you want to be. Let's talk, about, let's talk about this motto I want us all to remember. I'm willing to accept the pain of correction to see the results of growth. Man, don't, don't, just, don't just block people who want to bring correction and wisdom into your life. Make them your best friends. If you really want to be wise and you really want to grow in life and you want to become a better mom, a better dad, a better worker, a better boss, a better leader, a better business owner, whatever you want, a better anything, the best leaders are the best learners. The, the best leaders are the best learners. This is so, this is so important in our lives. Pro, uh, Proverbs 13 says this about a teachable life. People who despise advice are asking for trouble. Those who respect a command will succeed. The instruction of the wise is a life-giving fountain. Those who accept it avoid the snares of death. Let's get real practical. Let's get real practical towards the end of this message. I want you to be able to take some things home with you and put them into practice. Maybe just, maybe today. Don't even wait till Monday, y'all. Let's do it today. What do learners do that others don't? Number one, learners initiate. Man, they take the first step. They go after correction. It's one level to be like, okay, I'll receive it when it comes. But if it doesn't come, man, that's cool too. Learners, they go find people who can bring correction in their life. They find someone who's wise, that is willing to speak into their life. And if you're really good, you'll get like three or four or five of these people. And you'll be in contact with them all the time. And you'll be asking them questions, you know, whatever your context is. Maybe you're, a, maybe you're a business leader. You'll find other business leaders who are better than you, and you'll constantly ask them, hey, what could, I, what could I do to make my business better? Do you see how applicable this is? This is so, the Bible is so clear about some issues in our life. I want us to catch this. Learners initiate. They reach out for wisdom. What could I be doing better? Ask your boss. Ask your spouse. Come on, let me hear an, a good amen from the person sitting next to you on that. They, they ask their spouse. They ask their coworkers. They ask anyone who has good fruit in their life, anybody who has good fruit in their life. And you know who else you can ask? In James 1, it says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. God will give you instruction too. When's the last time you asked God to correct you? <laughs> It's been a while for me. You know, it's not like my go-to prayer in the morning. Hey, God, um, correct me because I know I need to learn so much. No, I don't say that very often, but the Bible says we should. Ask God for wisdom. And we know wisdom, with wisdom comes instruction and listening. Not only people ask God, and yes, it's a good thing to ask for. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I had Christian values in my home, but we didn't, um, we didn't go to church. Or I didn't grow up in church. I went to church a couple times with my neighbors, you know, but we would pray, like, at Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving dinner, and I think I went to, like, a candlelight service for, for, for you know, Christmas, you know, but that was just my context, right? My, my parents would say things like, um, you know, be careful about asking for, pa for patience because you'll, you'll get in trouble a lot, and that'll teach you patience, so be careful what you ask God, and it was almost like a deterrent, like, don't ask God for patience, but I'm saying, Ask him. Ask him for patience, even if it means you get in trouble a little bit and it teaches you patience. Ask for wisdom, even if that brings correction in your life. I'm saying do it anyways because it's worth it. It's worth it. The slight discomfort at the front end is worth a better life. I, kn I know you're seeing this. I know you're seeing this. So learners initiate. Um, I got uh, 
so many stories. <laughs> I don't have time to tell them all. But let me tell you a quick, quick story about, about two of the, of the biggest churches in America today. Um, Life Church is led by and pastored by a guy named Craig Groeschel. I listen to his leadership podcast all the time. He's a, it's a great resource for anybody who wants to grow in ministry or as a business leader, actually. He, his, his church, there's about 100,000 people every weekend that go to that church. It's, I can't even picture that. I don't know what that's like. Another guy is named Chris Hodges. Pastor a church called Church of the Highlands, and he's more like, he got the systems down. He actually was a resource for us. He's a resource for us um, for a lot of this material. Isn't it good? I mean, it's really good stuff. And 15 years ago, their churches were a lot smaller, a lot smaller. Like, you know, I think Craig Rochelle's church was like 10, 11,000, you know, real small, real small little church, you know, 10,000, you know, just little tiny. There ain't a church like that in like 100 miles from here. But, and then Chris Hodges, the smaller church, it was like 3,500. So these are still big churches, but 15 years ago, it was massively smaller then. Here's the story. Chris Hodges, the smaller church pastor, finally gets Craig Rochelle to come out and speak at his church. And so he speaks. It's great. Have a great time. They go out to dinner later. And, you know, when you're going out to dinner with someone, you wait until you order to actually start having conversation. You know, having like, if you have something to talk about, you know, like you wait until after the waiter goes away. And you order your food. So right after the waiter goes away and they're, or they're ordering the food, um, they both whip out notebooks at the same time and that have questions written on them. And Chris Hodge is like, dude, wh wh what's that? And, and Craig Rochelle, the bigger church pastor, is like, oh, this is a list of questions I wanted to ask you. And, and Chris is like, man, I, I only invited you so I could get some FaceTime with you, so I could learn from you. And the other pastor, Pastor Craig, said, I only accepted the invitation so I could come and learn from you. You know what that was? That was a showdown of church leaders. That was a showdown of learners that actively and aggressively, and it's no surprise to me that they're the largest churches anywhere because they're hungry. They want to learn. They want to grow. They want to know. So that's a slight picture for us, man. If we can learn this practice in our life, how much greater, how much further along could we be if we could learn this practice in our life? So learners initiate. Number two, learners implement. Learners implement. They don't just hear what, what you're saying. They don't just ask the questions. They turn right around and they put it to practice in their life right then and right there. They go. Learners implement. That's why James 1.22 says be doers of the word, not just hearers. Because if you just hear it and don't do it, you, you are deceiving yourself into thinking that you're, that you're walking with him, that you're doing, that you're actually growing. Don't deceive yourselves. It's the doers that get that payoff. It's the doers that get that fruit in their life. It's the doers, not just the hearers. It's one thing to take notes in church. It's another thing to put those principles to life on, on, in your life on Monday. That's why I love you guys as a church. Man, yeah, I love how the church is still a size where we're able to hear a lot of what's going on. And we, we talk about hard issues sometimes. And some people come back on Monday and they text me or Tiffany and they say, hey, we're, we want to do this. And I love that. It's better than you guys saying amen. It's better than you guys going, yeah, that's a good word, pastor. I don't care if you guys look at me like this the whole time. I don't care. You know what I really do care about? You taking this stuff and putting it to practice in your life so, and actually seeing life change from it where it actually increases your life. It actually adds, to va adds value to your life. That's what I really want to see. And today is actually Implementation Sunday. It's amazing. We had people who, who gave their lives to Jesus who said, I'm going to implement what you're saying. We talk about baptisms every week. They decided to get baptized today. And they wanted to implement some of these, pr some of these practices in their life. We had people go through growth track today. And this is step four. This is like join the team. Get on with it. And it's People are implementing this stuff in their lives, and the testimonies are all the same. Number one, the testimony is, I don't have time for that, and everything kind of stays the same. Testimony number two is, ah, it was a stretch, but I'm really glad I did. That's the constant, consistent feedback that we give. And so number three, learners improve. Learners improve. In fact, we have a saying around here, everything is either new, improved, or improving. We're constantly growing, changing, and improving. We're actually afraid of complacency. You know the saying in Wayne's world, we fear change. <laughs> we have a saying, we fear not changing. We fear it because we know, we know that in our lives, we know from our experience that, that resting in our comfort zone and just doing what we've always done leads to death in our lives. Leads to death. You know, there's no real gray area there. It's black and white. It's not like 
you know, there's heaven and hell. It's not like, well, you know, I just like kind of be good and just go right in the middle. God's a little bit black and white about a lot of these issues. And let me tell you something physiologically true in your own body. You are either growing or you are either dying. Every single plant that ever existed is either growing or dying. It might be growing really slowly, and it looks like it's just constant. But let me tell you, it's not. It's either growing or it's dying. And it may be dying very slowly. But let me tell you, it's either dying or growing. Every living thing, yourself included, is either growing or dying. And I don't know about you, but I want to be taking steps to where I need to go, not from where I need to go. So I know I have to constantly be evaluating. I need to look at my life in, in reality and not just say, oh, well, I'm a pastor. Everything's fine. N- no, it's not fine. I have to constantly look at my life and say, well, how's my Bible reading going? How's my prayer life? How are these things really going? And actually look at these things and say, you know what? Every year I want to add, even if it's just a little bit, I want to add something. Because I know I'm either growing or I'm dying. I don't know about you. I don't want to die. I don't want to die spiritually. I don't want that. And I don't want that for either one of you, any one of you. I'm going to tell you, I want to brag on someone really fast, someone from this church. Her name is Michelle Clark. Michelle Clark. Michelle and her husband, Brandon, came to us, I think, when we started pastoring about six and a half years ago. We started pastoring this church. And they were one of the first families that ever came, knew. The church was, was real, real small. We had a first service, but the church was like this big, maybe a little bit smaller, total. That was it. And so, like, new family, come on, man, let's go. We were really happy about it. And they came because they wanted to get their oldest son, Cruz, baptized. And we said, well, we don't do, like, baby baptisms. We do baby dedications, but it's almost the same thing. You're just dedicating them. We just sat with them at Starbucks, the Starbucks on 99. I can still remember it. And year over year, so they got plugged in. They got stuck in. They started coming. You know, it wasn't, like, overnight. But every step of the way, it was, like, every year, it was just, like, a little bit closer, a little bit more. Okay, I'll join the dream team. Okay, I'll get baptized. Okay, next year. Okay, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll, I'm happy to report today that, that Michelle and her husband are leading their first life group this semester. When the semester starts, they are leading their first life group. She went from someone who knew nothing about nothing, and now she's going to invite people into her home and share with them about anxiety. Anxious for nothing is the name of their group. Man, I am so, that, that is what it's all about to me is watching people just take one little step closer to Jesus at a time. Man, I don't don't care how close you are. It's what direction you're going in. Are you heading towards him? Are you heading from him? I don't care how far you are. Man, if you just take one little step closer. I never prayed before, but I just, I say a couple words in the morning now. Man, that's the right direction. Come on, somebody. That's the right direction. Let me tell you something about life groups, too. Our life groups are starting up in about one week. We got, we got groups in Lodi. We got groups in Stockton. We got groups in Lockford. Come on, somebody. We got men's groups. We got women's groups. We got marriage groups. We got financial groups. We got groups about nothing. We got groups about something. I'm telling you, there's a group for you. So if you haven't gotten involved in one of our life groups before, let me tell you something. That's the way God intended for his church to function. Little groups of four and five here and there really loving each other, really listening to each other. Not just here on Sundays and being like, oh, yeah, how you doing? That's great. All right, next person, how you doing? That's great. This is cool and everything. I know you guys enjoy it. That's why you're here. But the church was always designed to be where we really love each other and we have friends here. That's what I want for all of you. I would encourage you guys to get involved in that. James 3.17 says, but the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others, full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds, shows no favoritism, and is always sincere. Let me ask you a question. Who are you willing to listen to in order to receive wisdom? Are you willing to listen to your pastor? Hey, glad to hear it. Are you willing to listen to your boss? Probably. Are you willing to listen to your spouse? Crickets. Got it. (laughs) Noted. Are you willing to listen to your kids? Are you willing to listen to someone else's kids? Let me tell you, one time I was preaching on this platform right here, and a little kid walks up to me after the message and said, hey, man, you talk too much. I was speechless. The heck? But what did I, I was, I, you know what? To be honest with you, though, I want even little kids to enjoy coming to church. I don't want them to grow up and be like, man, I'm so bored. Can't wait for this to be over. I don't want that. So what do I need to do? I need to listen to the opinion of someone's little kid 
coming and even telling me a blind spot that I can't see in my own life. Even someone else's kid I'm willing to listen to. After the first service today, someone came up to me because I had an illustration about something, and I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think there could be anything wrong with it. But they came up to me and said, hey, pastor, there, there's a chance that somebody actually went through that little joke you told, and it could really hurt them. And I thought, I don't want that. I don't want some first-time person to, to, to show up and this story that I told that involves, you know, something. I'm not going to say it because, you know, I don't want anybody to be offended. And I, you know what I did? I sat, I sat there and did exactly what I said. Thank you for telling me that. I didn't see that before. Thank you for sharing on the heels of a message. Now, that doesn't mean I'm blown around by anything everybody says. That's not what the point is. The point is I'm listening. I'm listening to you. I, I want to receive correction. I want to receive as much wisdom as I can. It's important to me. It's important to me. I'll get it from anybody I can. That little kid after the message, how about your own mother? My own mother, man, she's been trying to tell me. What's the natural response when your mom wants to tell you something? I know, I know, I know, I know. What's that meme? It's like a little song. I know, I know. Mom's trying to tell you, you know, honey, you shouldn't do that. I know, I know, I know. You don't want to listen to it. My mom is no different than anybody else's. She's a health nut, and she likes to put kale and other weird stuff in a blender, mix it all up, and drink it for breakfast every morning. And I'm like, oh, I'm drinking that. She's like, you know, honey, those cheeseburgers are going to catch up with you. My mom, if you're watching, I know you don't talk like that, but it's just funnier if I do that. You know, those cheeseburgers, you can't keep getting those four by fours, honey. It's going to catch up with you a little bit. You know, you're not as young as you used to be. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm listening, right? But then I, I meet a friend recently who's really into eating healthy, and working out. And I'm like, oh, milkshakes, huh? That's cool. That all of a sudden it's cool. But how much earlier in my life could I have learned that if I just would have been willing to listen and willing to improve, even though it came from dear old mom, right? Come on, somebody. Let's, let's look at this last one. This is my last thing. Learners inspire. Learners inspire. Now, this is where the shift happens. Because it's one thing to just be focused on you and yourself and wanting to get better. And if that's where you're at, man, I'm glad you're here. But, but the truly wise, the truly wise, this is where it shifts and, and they, they turn the corner, so to speak, to where it goes from I'm, I'm listening to I want to inspire others to be able to get this wisdom too. I think of evangelism. I think of the way we want to share Christ with people. You know, it's not, it's not enough that we would just want to be saved and go to heaven just for myself, but everybody else, man, they can just do whatever they want to do. They can just burn. No, no, no. We don't feel that way. This church doesn't operate that way. And so that's one of the examples I, I have is that if we can share this wisdom, wise people know that if I can make myself wise and everyone around me wise, it's going to make all of us better. When the waters rise, every boat goes up. Wisdom is not competitive, it's not like there's not enough room in heaven for all of us to get there. There is enough room in heaven for all of us to get there. So we should be thinking creatively, like, how can I share with someone so that they can get some of this stuff? You know, it's, it's so important. James 3, 18 says, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. We talked about that a lot last week about sowing and reaping. There's a very popular scripture that goes, that which a man sows, that he will also reap. It's basically like saying, if you throw an apple seed in the ground, it's an apple tree that's going to grow up. And you won't just get one seed back. You'll get thousands of seeds back, right? And the same is true for all the good things in your life and all the bad things. If you s sow into the ground anger, frustration, hatred, you're going to get those things. Those things will flourish, but if you sow generosity, if you, if you sow wisdom, if you sow kindness, you will, you will receive those things. It is a global truth. It is true for every single area of our lives. And wisdom is no different. We talked about that a lot. And I need to tell you before this message is over that I, I wasn't always good at this. In fact, there was a season of my life where I was extremely bad at this. I don't know how many of you can share this experience, but I used to be a really bad drug addict and a really bad alcoholic. And there was actually a point in my, in my 
life where I was on the receiving end of an intervention put on by my extended family, and it was super awkward, super embarrassing, and I was holding at the time, and I came home, and all my family's there, and they're like, listen, listen, Elliot, you have a newborn son. I have a 14-year-old son, in case you guys didn't know, and this, so this was many years ago. You have a newborn son. You cannot keep living this way. You are going to ruin your life. You are going to ruin his life. And I didn't receive it. I couldn't receive it. My heart was in a place where I didn't care what they thought or what they felt. I was only in myself. And one of the things my mom also used to tell me was, honey, please don't drink and drive. Please don't drink and drive. Please don't drink and drive. Don't ride with anybody who's drinking. Please don't, honey. Please don't. Please don't. But did I listen? No, I didn't. And so, of course, one night I, I get into a car with all my friends, and we're all drinking. We're all drunk like skunks, and we're in that car. We're partying, having a good time. Woohoo! And we're driving over the 10th Street Bridge in Yuba County. That's where I'm from. It's in between Marysville and Yuba City. There's a dirt bike track down there. A lot of people are familiar with that. And it's pretty high. It's at least 100 feet. It's really high. And back, back then, I'm not going to say how many years ago, none of your business, how many years ago it was. It was a lot of years ago. And the driver must have blacked out. And back then, there was just a little rinky-dink guardrail. But we hit that, we took out about 10 yards of guardrail, and it fell crashing down into the river. But somehow, our car just came to rest still on the bridge. I'm telling you, I should have listened. I could have lost everything. I wouldn't even be standing here in front of you. My son would be growing up without a dad. My kids that I have now, they wouldn't even be in existence. I can't even think about that. I can't even talk about that. Hurts me so bad to think about the choices and the rejection of wisdom. Rejecting wisdom consistently and constantly. And I don't want that for anybody. I don't want that for any of you. I want us to come to a place where even if it hurts, even if we're having fun with it, that we would receive this wisdom that's trying to come our way because it could save your life. Not just your life here on earth, but your eternity, where you are going to spend forever and ever. It could change everything. I don't, I don't want anybody to go through that. And some of you have an opportunity right now that I didn't have to make a decision to make a change in life before something terrible happens. Because you could lose everything if you don't receive wisdom, but think you could gain everything. You could get everything if you can receive this. So this last thing, this is the last little fill in the blank right here, and I want us to really get this. The habit of a teachable spirit produces a life of consistent wisdom. The habit, it's a habit. It's something we choose to implement in our life. I, I'm choosing to be teachable. I'm choosing to listen when people tell me. Even if it's right here on the platform and who are you telling? I'm the pastor. You don't need to tell me I can't preach on that. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen. It's a habit of, for me to listen and to receive that. The habit of a teachable spirit produces a life of consistent wisdom. And that's what we all want. We all want to get better. And that's my prayer for you is that you would receive this abundant wisdom that God wants to pour out all over your life. That's my prayer for you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I just know that, um, that God really spoke to somebody today. I don't know who it was. I know it was probably multiple. I said a lot of words just now, but with heads down, eyes closed, I know God is speaking to some hearts right in this moment. So I want to do something that we do every single week. I want to give you the opportunity. And they're going to start playing some music. Don't let that distract you too much. We just do that to try and make the atmosphere a little bit more comfortable if this is awkward for you. That's the only reason we do that. But I want you to do something with heads down, eyes closed, just privately. You can ask this under your breath, or you can just ask this in your heart. I want you to ask God what he's trying to say to you today. And I believe he'll answer you. You can just say it just like this. God, what are you, what are you trying to show me? What do you need me to change? What do you need me to do? Go ahead, just ask him right now, and I'll, I'll wait for him to speak. So I want to give an opportunity for everyone here as God is speaking, as God is moving in this place. There may be some of you here that 
um, you want to receive this message. You want to receive a relationship with God. And maybe you used to have a relationship with God, but somewhere along the way, something happened and you grew distant. You used to pray, you used to be in your Bible a little bit, you used to have a relationship. Maybe it was you as a kid, but somewhere along the way, you just grew distant. And some of you here, you want to get closer with him. You want to give your life back to him. And you want to start on a, on a new foot and say, Jesus, I'm giving my life to you. I'm giving my life back to you. And I want you to take the controls of my life. And for some of you, you have never made that decision on your own. Maybe you grew up going to church and your mom prayed the prayer for you. Your grandma prayed the prayer for you. You went to the youth group because they wanted you to. But you know in your heart, you have never made that step to say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life. As a conscious decision, I'm giving you my life. If I've described you in any way, shape, or form, I'm, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I want to ask you to lift your hand and just indicate to me and most importantly to God and to say, that's me. God, take the controls of my life. I'm done doing things my way. I've tried it my way, and it's never the best way. God, I'm ready to, I'm ready to do it your way. Give my life to you. If I've described you, go ahead and lift your hand. One, two, three, lift it to the sky. If you're ready to give your life to Jesus, yes, I see your hand, precious one. I see your hand. I see your hand. God sees you, most important of all. God sees your hand. Yes, Lord, people are coming to God in this moment. You can put your hands down, and this is what I want us to do. Come on, everyone in this house, I want you to repeat this prayer after me, and this is the most important prayer you'll ever pray in your entire life. Just say it right after I say it. Father God, I give my life to you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for my sin. Thank you for filling me with your spirit and guiding me, directing me, and loving me. I give everything to you. I give you my mistakes. I give you my trouble. I give you my heartache. And Lord, and Lord, replace it with kindness and patience and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. You know what to do. Come on, put your hands together for those that made that decision.